cleanness, the articulation. We're going to talk about Oscar Petter for today. Uh, this is an early, probably 54, Oscar Petter for Bethlehem 10-inch. Uh, beautiful stuff. Oscar is one of the real guys who uh, redefines his instrument. Uh, not every guy who comes along in jazz can do that. Most guys are more in the imitation field. And for the most part, you're imitating greats, so you can't go too wrong doing that. But uh, Oscar really was a guy that took jazz to a different level. Uh, we'll dig deeper into some of those things a little bit later. Let's start off at the beginning, September 30th, 1922. So that puts him as one of those depression teens who's going to be living as a teenager through the depression years. He's originally from Okmulgee, Oklahoma. So it's hard to imagine being born in Oklahoma in 1922. Uh, his mom was Choctaw. His father was part Cherokee, part black. And so you've got this, that combination of the greatest oppressed groups in American history. And that also gives you the status symbol of a guy who has two strikes against him when he walks into a room. The Native Americans have very little respect in this country. Uh, they're treated with no uh, mention, really. And it's funny how loudly we keep black and white divide in the media and the news constantly. The Native American stories are so swept under the rug, not discussed. We don't really hardly see them. We hardly talk about them or report about their issues. <clears throat> At most, we may discuss some of their crime. They've pretty much been swept aside into reservations, alcoholic treatment centers, and forgotten about. It's a great tragedy. And at least the black issues do get voiced and discussed and talk, spoke about. The Native American plight it's still ugly still and uh casinos aren't the solution you know uh it's not like those who come into the crowd are paying for anything it's preying on weak and vulnerable people who are without hope trying to find something to hope in casinos are kind of depressing places if you ask me uh so he's got a genealogy that is going to lead him to being an outsider almost in every camp he's in uh, even being even in black circles he's 75% Native American but he was obviously very accepted in the black community without any doubt and uh, he was a huge innovator in a lot of ways uh, him and Milt Hinton were friends going way back and I was going to make this episode about him and Milt but I'm going to try to keep this episode a little shorter uh, so we'll do Milt maybe tomorrow. Uh, actually, when he was young, 14 years old or so, he was living in Minneapolis, from what I'm told. Maybe that's a little later. But uh, he decided to quit bass. He didn't think he was going to make a living at it. And Milt Hinson, after five months, convinced him to come back and play. Uh, he has this quote where he says, I did not like the way people were playing bass, so I developed my own way of playing. And I think some of that is that clean articulation of tone, really finding the note and expressing it in a beautiful way. Uh, bass kind of was a plotting instrument before. It was just putting down the root. Uh, of course, Jimmy Blanton was Ellington's bass player for the longest time. He started developing an intricate approach in the 30s and 40s. And Pettiford obviously was influenced by that and influenced by Milt Hinton as well. And uh, Jimmy Blanton, Milt Hinton, Oscar Pettiford are kind of this genealogy that leads us up to Mingus. And uh, they're all innovative. They're all very modern players and lead the bass to becoming more of a instrument that was going to be solidly in the mix. And uh, we're going to start even giving leadership roles to bass players. They were very much just kind of in the background in the swing bands, twirling their bass around, laying down simple patterns, and being very repetitive in the swing era. Pettiford found alternate uh, appreggios and 
different approaches to his playing all the time. And it makes him a very beautiful player and makes his short but important discography of great value. Um, moving along here, in 42, he starts playing with Charlie Barnett. In 43, he plays with Coleman Hawkins on The Man I Love. Uh, he plays a little bit with Earl Hines and Ben Webster in the 40s. Uh, in 43, he moved to New York. And from what I heard, he moved from Minneapolis. I, I read several different sources about that, which is interesting because I'm a Minneapolis guy, even though I'm originally from Toronto. I've lived in Minneapolis forever. Um, when he moves to New York in 43, he is one of the guys at Minton's Playhouse, along with Kenny Clark, along with Thelonious Monk, along with Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker. These guys are the guys who start laying down the foundations of bebop. The abandoning of the simplicity and just playing the blues. And we're going to dig deeper and disseminate the chords and play all the intervals and allow us to be able to race through changes and play very intricate, fast tempos. Uh, bebop was a great change in the jazz landscape. No one embodied that greater than Charlie Parker, but of course, Guys like Pettiford are very important parts of that movement. Him and Kenny Clark were laying down those grooves. Um, in 45, he joins Ellington's group for a little while. And I'm not sure if it was right when Jimmy Blanton passed, but he definitely fills the Ellington chair for a while. He's, he's part of the Carnegie Hall concerts, which I don't have to show you. Uh, Ellington's body of work is so massive. Um, he actually found Cannibal Adderley. He was tricked to letting him on the band, the band stage and by one of his bandmates, if I understand right. And uh, he challenged this new guy on, on stage by choosing a very difficult piece. And Cannibal killed it. And it leads to Cannibal, of course, signing with Savoy, Emerson, and of course, one of the great careers in modern jazz. Uh, Pettiford also innovated jazz cello, which was something we hadn't really heard of or even thought of. He comes along, brings the cello, which is obviously a smaller instrument. He first does it with Woody Herman as a joke. He leaves the stage and comes back with a cello, tuned like a bass. But he found ways to play the cello and voice it like he was playing the bass, essentially. And he very much became an innovator on the jazz cello, leading Ray Brown into taking it up. And Ray Brown, of course, one of the great bass players that we're also going to talk about in the coming weeks or months. Um, I'm a big fan of Pettiford. My friend Jean Michel, uh, Jean Michel Reeser Beethoven, has talked to me quite a bit about the importance of Oscar Pettiford going into Ray Brown, of course, and him and Ray Brown were great friends. Uh, a lot of what I talk about, a lot of things I've felt in jazz and in the black experience, my friend Jean Michel from Switzerland, he did a lot of concert promoting for jazz in the 80s and 90s and 2000s at a lot of the great jazz festivals. He met a lot of these guys as a young guy. Guys like Count Basie, he sat on their knee. Uh, so he actually validates a lot of the things I feel by telling me this is the, this is what those guys told him. I can tell you how I feel about some of the black experience, and I've experienced some of it firsthand as a DJ in the black community here in Minneapolis. But when I post some of these thoughts and feelings, and he watches and goes, you know, that's exactly what a lot of these guys told me why they went to Europe, that's how they felt living in America, that was their daily experience. It kind of empowered me to speak about it even louder, knowing that a guy who knew these guys well is telling me that that's exactly the mark and that this stuff needs to be said. And so I do like to bring it up a lot because I think if we don't understand the black experience, we can't possibly understand jazz. Jazz, after all, is a black man's music. Uh, let's take a closer look at that lovely Bethlehem 10-inch, gorgeous inner label. This is his second Bethlehem 10-inch. Uh, it's called Basically Duke. And it's got a lot of Duke guys on, if I recall. Jimmy Wilder. No, it doesn't really. Clark Terry was a Ellington alumni. Jimmy Hamilton was too. Dave, Shul Dave Shulkrout's on this. We were just talking about him the other day. Danny Bank, Earl Knight, Jimmy Cleveland, Joe Wilder. So there's some great players on this record. Uh, they play a lot of Allington songs. Uh, gorgeous. 
Burt Goldblatt cover. I'm a big fan of Bethlehem 10 inch series. The entire series from 1001 through 1038 or so, it's all great modern jazz with nice levels of composition, uh, arrangements, great players. Um, this, of course, would have been the New York side of Bethlehem, and they did have a very big department on the West Coast eventually and made a lot of stuff up there as well. Uh, when he signs with Bethlehem, his, those first two 10 inches, one of them gets reissued here with a Vinnie Burke 12, 10 inch, and so you don't really need both. I found this one first, Bethlehem 6. Like I said, it is a reissue of some 10 inch Bethlehem stuff. Uh, you can hear the Ellington there, it's beautiful. This is Bethlehem B33. Another great Burt Goldblatt cover by the looks of it. Uh, we'll give this a little spin as well. It's very nice. Let's take a look who's on this one. G.G. Grice, wow, young guy. Jerome Richardson, Ozzy Johnson, Bobby Brookmeyer, Ernie Royal. Oh my gosh, a young Don Bird is on this. That's crazy. Oscar Petter for leader and bass. Don Bird is on trumpet. I never noticed that before. So here we find Donald Bird, probably 1955 or six. So that's right around the same time that he's making that first record at Savoy. So that's a very early sighting of Donald Bird. I can't believe I never noticed that before. So as we move into the 50s, from 52 through 1960 when he passes, he does some great recordings. This is also a reissue of the other Bethlehem 10 inch, this time coupled with the Red Mitchell, another bass player's 10 inch. So both of his 10 inches do get reissued on LP. And I had the LPs first. Eventually I started collecting the 10 inch series and being the guy that I am, I collected them all. This is a, ser a session, probably 57, and I think it's called from multiple different sessions. And Petterford's one of the leaders of this session, but just some great players show up on this record, including Coltrane, Donald Byrd, Gene Quill, Kenny Burrell, Art Farmer. In 57, Maybe even 56, he makes his first record with uh, Oscar Pettiford here. I mean, with ABC, sorry. And uh, his ABC records are outstanding. He's put together a pretty large group of his ABC recordings. Oscar Pettiford, Whitey Mitchell, Ernie Royal, at Arthur Farmer, Jimmy Cleveland, Tommy Flanagan, Gigi Grice, Julius Watkins, David Amram, French Horn, Jerome Richardson, Ozzy Johnson, Lucky Thompson, and he does also appear on Lucky Thompson's ABC records as well, which are fantastic. Uh, yeah, these are this is the great stuff, and he is one of the great composers and bass band leaders in jazz history. He composes numerous pieces that have become part of the jazz songbook. Uh, Bohemia After Dark, uh, Tricotism, uh, Laverne's Walk, Swing Until the Girls Come Home. Those are all standards that he composed. And when you're playing with Ellington and you're part of that lineage, it probably just gets in your blood. This is his second uh, record on ABC, probably 58 or 59 by this time. Probably 58, because he goes to Denmark in 58 to, to live. I think there's a lot of the same group here. You see Gigi Grice, Benny Golson. Beautiful. Uh, 
and there's Oscar, part Choctaw, part Cherokee, part African American, leading his own group and being one of the great innovators in jazz. Uh, jazz was a great opportunity for these guys. You know, these guys didn't have a lot of options in life, and jazz became one of those great outlets for them. This is Oscar Pettiford, the last recording with the late, great Oscar Pettiford on the Jazzland Riverside label. Uh, Jazzland in the early 60s starts issuing vault stuff on the Jazzland impression. This is the classic of modern jazz volume two. So Oscar's been dead for a few years already. It looks like this was recorded in Denmark in 1960, 1959. Mont Mark Blues out, Laverne Walk, Two Little Pearls. I have not put this on in a while. That's awesome. If that gives you any indication of where Oscar Pettiford was going, we lost a great guy. Because this is fantastic. You hear that clear bass. Recorded in Copenhagen, Denmark, 5th and 6th, 1960. And a couple tracks were recorded on October 22nd, 1959. I would have to guess this probably got issued in Europe on Steeplechase. Is that too soon for two? It probably is too early for Steeplechase. It probably got issued in Europe on something. Jean-Michel maybe can tell me. But this is probably a licensed American version of it on Riverside. Great stuff. And so that wraps up his stuff as a leader because he passes so suddenly. He contacts a virus that's linked to polio and, he, and dies the next day in, in Europe in the hospital. And uh, it's just, it kind of, oh, I can't help but think of how the Native Americans were given blankets with polio. It's, it's not pretty. Um, he, as a sideman, is part of a lot of great records. And I'm gonna dig into some of the stuff here. Musings of Miles, probably 1954, maybe 55. doesn't say clearly. But he's playing with Red Garland, Philly Joe Jones. So this is before he found Paul Chambers. Uh, just a quartet it looks like. That's something I was thinking about last night is how rarely Miles Davis plays in a quartet. It's not a setting he's that versed in or comfortable in apparently. I think he likes having other guys take the spotlight on the stage and uh, giving him a chance to kind of retreat. Um, and like I've often said before, and I want to do an episode on this soon, what are the greatest Miles Davis records that don't have John Coltrane, Wayne Shorter, or Gil Evans starring? I'll give you a second to think about that. You take out the first quintet Coltrane stuff, the second quintet Shorter Hancock stuff, and then the Gil Evans arranged stuff. Now you tell me what's the best of what's left over. And there's a lot of stuff still. A lot of early prestige stuff, debut stuff, uh, there's Blue Note stuff. There's stuff, obviously a lot of stuff later. There's stuff in between the two quintets where Sonny Stitt, Sam Rivers, Hank Mobley. Uh, there's another guy too. Four guys fill the sax chair there and none of them really have any staying power with Miles. It's not until he finds Shorter and uh, makes that real change. He's also Pettiford on this first Miles Davis Blue Note record, which to me is not great Miles Davis. It's, he's definitely in between. He's not a bebop player, and he's not quite yet uh, the Miles that we know of coming up later in the 50s. Uh, this is uh, Ellington's Strayhorn record, Piano Duets. And uh, I think
think it's just it's a small group. Petter, Petterford, Strayhorn, Wendell Marshall on a couple tracks. It's actually really cool stuff. This is another record my friend John Michelle was talking to me about. And I can't remember what he was telling me about it. But uh, I think it was recorded in 50. And Riverside gets this stuff, 476. So it's after Riverside's folded. So whoever is, is controlling the Riverside name is buying up tapes of unreleased stuff, European stuff, and they're they're finishing out the 400 sequence from about 450 to 500. And most of that last 50 records isn't stuff that was recorded as a Riverside session. So if you're buying late 400 Riverside stuff, just know that's going to be the case. Um, again, we're, we're just going to kind of go quickly through some of his side work here, since there is a great deal of it. And it just shows you the body of work that he's a part of. The great Mill Jackson, another guy who has an episode coming soon. Uh, I love Milt. He, of course, is a member of the Modern Jazz Quartet for years with John Lewis and Gang. But all that time, Milt is making records on his own. And the rigidity and chamber uh, music that the Modern Jazz Quartet makes at times is very much in contrast with the bluesy, up-tempo, free-loving jazz that Milt makes on his own. Whether it's at Savoy, whether it's at Atlantic, Milt is a fun player with a ton of juice, a ton of energy, life. Uh, one of the great blues players ever. Uh, I just, I'm a huge Milt Jackson guy. I have pretty much his entire body of work from his Savoy stuff in the early, mid 50s, all the way into the late 60s where there's a few titles there I start to be missing, but I got 40 records of his as a leader, and that's an insane body of work for a guy who's made that many records with the MJQ. Uh, with Ray Charles here, and Ray Charles in his early Atlantic era has records in the 1200 series, 1279 here, that are strict instrumental jazz stuff. Ray can play. Ray and Milt here are fantastic. They do a second record together probably a year and a half later. Great stuff. Big fan. Um, this is a pretty impressive body of work. Max Roach, Deeds, Not Words, Sonny Rollins, Freedom Sweet, two of the landmark records of both those artists, Pettiford's a part of them. Pettiford helped make a record distinct. Uh, this Jazz Messenger record on Columbia, Drum Suite, it's very much percussion and rhythm driven. Uh, there's some great tracks on here. Uh, I think there's some other horn players at times. I can't recall it, actually. It's been a while since I put that on. Swingin', a Kenny Burrell record that was released in Japan in the 80s on Blue Note. Uh, Pettiford is on some of these tracks. This is called from a few different sessions and outtakes. Tough record to find. Um, his buddy Monk, who they played at Milton's Playoffs together in 43-44, when he signs with Riverside, his first three records has young Billy Strayhorn holding down the rhythm. Uh, I actually love Monk Plays Ellington. It's a little more conservative Monk. It's Riverside trying to break him in and find him an audience. And while it may not be as innovative as what Monk does a little later on, in fact, three short records later, he does Brilliant Corners, which is pretty big corner turn as well. But these three first uh, Riversides, Pettiford's playing with his buddy Monk, and I love Monk's Riverside stuff, especially that early stuff. Uh, I mentioned he has some stuff with Coleman in the 40s. He reprises his, his playing with Coleman here in probably 56 or 7, probably 56, uh, Hawk Flies High. This is an OJC pressing of that. I'd like to find an old copy of that eventually because I love that cover. The Hawk being Coleman Hawkins. Uh, this is a Teddy Charles record with Oscar Pettiford and Hal Overton. Three for Duke. 
the three of them are playing uh, Ellington tracks. The great Helen Merrill and Emerson, her first and third record, Pettiford's playing bass on, probably 54, probably 56 on that one. So Pettiford's a busy guy. As well as doing all his own recordings and leading his own groups on ABC and Bethlehem, he's also finding time to play with a lot of the greats in jazz. The great Jimmy Cleveland, who I talked about in my trombone episode, if you gave me a minute to think, is my favorite trombone player. The guy spits fire. He's an incredible player. Uh, Pettiford's on his solo debut. Uh, this is called Introducing on Emerson, and uh, there's an incredible band on that record. Clark Terry's first Emerson record, probably 1954. This has um, a wonderful Cecil Payne, Jimmy Cleveland, Horace Silver's on the piano on this, and of course Pettiford's on the bass. Herbie Mann does a couple records on Riverside, and Pettiford seems to be doing quite a bit of side work for Riverside 56, 57 in that era. Of course, he's going to go to Denmark in 58. Um, Afro-Cuban, 54 Blue Note. Another Riverside Kenny Dorham, probably 56 on that one. Great records. Uh, Afro-Cuban was a 10-inch initially. It's a pretty landmark recording. Kenny Dorham, J.J. Johnson, Cecil Payne, Hank Mobley, Horace Silver, Oscar Pettiford, Potato Valdez, and Art Blakey. So, on a record like that, you've got a lot of the great players in New York on this record. Dorham, Johnson, Payne, Mobley, Silver, Pettiford, Blakey. It's a pretty high royalty, and in 54, Blue Note's starting to become the Blue Note we know. The Birdland, Blakey stuff starting to come out. This Dorham stuff starting to come out. The Tenon series is about to be coming, come to an end. And we're starting to move into that 12-inch series. And by 55, 56, Blue Note and the 1500 series become one of the great chapters in jazz history. And what, and what Blue Note does in the late 50s is still the top of the mark still just royalty. Probably 55 here. Bethlehem does a lot of stuff in 55. This is Irby Green, the trombone player who came from a lot of the swing bands. Uh, Pettiford played with him on this because he's obviously uh, part of the Bethlehem studio group. Ernie Henry, a New York musician. Uh, this is called from a few different sessions. Uh, Riverside puts this out in Probably 58, 266. Uh, some great tracks on here. Pettiford's a part of some of that stuff. The fantastic uh, Phineas Newborn. Great record. Lovely picture of Central Park there. Pettiford's playing bass on now on Atlantic. Sonny Stitt on the Roost label plays arrangements of Quincy Jones. We talked about this in the Sonny Stitt episode. That's a great record. Pettiford's on that. Earl Coleman. This is some prestige stuff. I think it's from 53, 54. Again, it doesn't say. But I think this is earlier than when it came out. Jolton Joe Rowland, the vibe player on uh, Savoy. Pettiford shows up on that. And this fabulous, fabulous jazz mode record. This is Charlie Rouse and Julius Watkins. And, uh, Watkins, of course, plays French horn. It's some interesting, interesting stuff. It grooves in every sense of the jazz bird, but it adds interesting instruments. The French horn itself has an interesting voice. And you start adding some of that female choral work on top of it. It's just very interesting stuff. Uh, Ron Jefferson on the drums. Gilda Mahone's on the piano, Paul Chambers is on the bass here, and then augmented by Janet Putnam uh, on the harp, Eileen Gilbert on the soprano voice. So they have this one gal singing this kind of stuff. It's just fantastic. You gotta love, love, love Oscar Pettiford. Recognize his place in jazz. He 
He's one of the true greats, one of the great innovators. He redefines his instrument. He's a great composer, a great band leader. He's an example of a guy that went to Europe to escape the oppression here. And he's a guy that a lot of the modern jazz fans kind of ignore. You know, he's part of an earlier circle of musicians, an earlier universe than the Miles Coltrane that most people kind of come into. And not enough people go backwards. But Pettiford's there with the Monks and the Kenny Clarks and the Parkers and Gillespies changing the face of jazz. And from the mid-40s up to the time of his passing in 1960, Oscar Pettiford was the man on the bass. Mill Tinton, of course, was his compatriot at that same time, but Mill's a part of that great rhythm the great rhythm section, and they're, they're so booked that Pettiford's getting just oodles of work. Chicago, New York, his own groups. It's a prolific 15 years, and jazz is changing rapidly. He's introducing the cello. He's changing the face of bass as a band leader, as a co composer. He's just a super influential guy. And I think too many people can't tell the difference between Oscar Pettiford and Oscar Peterson. If you don't know the difference, you need to dig a little deeper into your jazz knowledge. Because Pettiford's a very important cat. And uh, he's one of the guys I really, when I put one of his records on, I'm always impressed by the compositions and the beauty of it, yet it always swings. It always swings. So here's to the Choctaw, here's to the Cherokee, here's to the African Americans. Oscar, you made them all proud. What a great career, what a great legacy. It's sad we lost them so young. Y'all have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Peace.